So lecture six, uh, electrostatic boundary value problems. So in this chapter, which concludes our electrostatic uh, um, problems, we are gonna learn a few special techniques to solve electrostatic problems. Specifically, uh, we are gonna learn a series expansion method and also the image charge method. So we are gonna learn basically uh, two methods that is very useful in solving uh, electrostatic problems. So before we move on, uh, let's uh, revisit uh, uh, what we learned. We learned Gauss law, right? If we have a charge, uh, free charge, we have a, a D field associated with it. And then it can be written like this way too. And then we know the electrostatic potential uh, and the electric field are related like this. Negative gradient of V is E. This is just a um, by definition. So if you combine these two relation, it becomes like this. Di negative divergence of epsilon of gradient of V is rho F V, right? And then if we assume epsilon is not uh, uh, vary as a function of space, then we can just take this out, right? Because it becomes irrelevant to the, uh, uh, to the uh, derivative operators, differential operators. So if you take this out, then it becomes, uh, the equation becomes like this, right? So divergence of, I'm sorry, uh, Laplacian of V is equal to negative rho FV divided by epsilon. So this equation is called Poisson's equation. And then when there is no charge, like in the region where is no, uh, there is no uh, uh, free charge, uh, the right term becomes zero. So uh, we have uh, Laplacian V is zero. This is Laplace equation. Okay, so we are gonna learn how to solve these equations, Poisson's equation and Laplace equation in, in various formats. So uh, just to recap, uh, if I write the Laplace operators in a few different, uh, in a few different coordinate systems, like here, Cartesian coordinate, it's written like this, cylindrical and spherical coordinates, it's written in, in more complicated form but we know why Laplacian takes this form in these coordinate systems. We learned this, right, in our, in our mathematics uh, review course. Okay, and here I'm going to tell you about a, um, a, a con convenient theorem that is very useful actually uh, in, in, in solving these equations. It's called a uniqueness theorem. And then uh, it, it's easier to understand the uniqueness theorem if you just take into account the example of the one-dimensional Laplace equation. So let's say you have a one-dimensional Laplace equation like this, right? Laplace equation again is this, and the one-dimensional Laplace equation is this, right? This equation is extremely easy so that you can obtain uh, like a general solution for this, right? If you, uh, the general solution of this is mx plus b. m and b are constants that are not determined yet, right? And then, so in order to uniquely define v, you need two boundary conditions, right? So you need to know v at I don't know, some, some, some point. And then you also need to know, know uh, V at the other point, right? Then you can, you, you, you can from these two relations, you can uh, uh, uniquely define M and B, right? So that's the, and your solution becomes unique, okay? This is called boundary value problem. So you have a boundary, conditions, right? 
and you get the solution uniquely. And then this can be extended into uh, 3D easily, like here. So three-dimensional Laplace equation and Boisson's equation. Uh, electric field, or in this case, the, uh, what's important is the electric field, right? Not the potential, but electric field is uniquely determined if one of the following boundary conditions are satisfied. So uh, like here, at the, there are many uh, different sort of uh, boundary conditions. It has uh, their own name, but uh, like, you know, uh, you, can, you can just uh, consider it's, uh, it's not, it's just uh, different names. Like uh, what you need is if you know uh, V, at all boundary points of 3D volume, you can uniquely define V. And, and similar thing applies too. Or you can also have E, uh, you know all the E values at the boundary, you can uniquely define uh, E everywhere. So this is uniqueness theorem, okay? Um, Yes, yes, this is uniqueness theorem. And, and if you don't understand why this is the case, you can, uh, again, you can just go back and think about this problem. So let's say uh, you have like uh, your, your function V is defined from X1 to X2. Let's say this is two bounded uh, values. And then uh, the uh, M and B are unknowns, but once you know the boundary, uh, the the potential values at the boundary points, everything inside is just fixed as a unique value. And similar thing happens in this case. In 3D, if you know the, all the boundary values, all the, all the values in the, in the, in the, of the surface, enclosing the problem volume, then what's inside is uniquely determined. Okay, so this is a, a boundary value problem, uh, uh, uniqueness theorem. So the reason uh, why this is useful is because um, once you figure out one solution that satisfies uh, Laplace equation and all the boundary conditions, then you don't need to worry about the possibility of the existence of the other solution, right? because that's the unique solution by uniqueness theorem. You see what I'm talking about? Let's say you just randomly guess the solution, okay? And fortunately, you got the solution, you got uh, just one answer that satisfies boundary condition and the Laplace equation at the same time. Then you don't need to worry about uh, the, the possibility whether you have other solution, right? Because that's the unique solution by, by this theorem. So that's the, the convenience of this theorem. Okay, so here's a simple case. Um, you have a semi-infinite conducting plane at phi equals zero. Phi equals zero means this plane. And then phi equals phi zero. The other plane. And then uh, uh, at, at a small, so at the, at the center here, z axis, they are disconnected. And then, and then one of the uh, plate is held at v equals zero, and then the other plane is held at v equals v naught. The question is uh, calculate v in the region between the planes. Okay, and uh, in solving this problem, uh, you can easily notice, you, you, you can easily know that V should not depend on Z, right? Because we have Z directional translational symmetry here. So V cannot depend on Z. And then uh, of course V is depends on, uh, on, on phi. Right, because phi when phi equals zero, v was v zero. But when phi was is phi zero, v is v zero. So of course it depends on phi. But let's look at 
uh, the uh, Laplace equation first. Okay. And then here, the, the way that I solve this problem is this way. We first assume that V only depends on phi. I don't think this is trivial thing because, you know, V cannot depend on Z, that's trivial. But V cannot depend on rho, it's not entirely trivial in this case, right? But let's assume it. Let's assume that V is like not dependent on rho because that kind of makes sense because if you look at the boundary conditions, boundary condition doesn't depend on rho. So maybe uh, what's inside is also uh, independent of rho, but it's not like justified yet. Okay, just assuming that V is de depends on only phi. And then if you write a, a, a Laplace equation, then uh, the, the solution for the Laplace equation looks really easy. Like V is A, a phi plus B. It's just an easy solution. And then let's see if uh, we have a solution that satisfies the boundary conditions. So apply the boundary condition. V when phi equals zero, then which gives you this value is zero uh, by, by this boundary condition. So this is the first boundary condition. And then if you apply the second boundary condition, when phi is phi zero, then uh, this equation becomes this, right? Because B is zero from, from the first boundary condition. So uh, A is V zero divided by phi zero. Right, so if we set the uh, potential like V zero phi divided by phi zero, then this satisfies Laplace equation plus all boundary conditions. Right, we have two boundaries. So all boundary conditions are satisfied so that this is the only solution. We don't need to worry about V uh, depend on tone rho because with this assumption, like V does not depend on rho, uh, the solution already satisfies uh, Laplace equation and the boundary conditions. This is the only solution. You don't need to worry about the existence of other solution, right? And then this is your uh, potential. And then electric field can be obtained uh, by taking the negative gradient of it. So every, everything's clear or um, you need more explanation? Probably up to this point, um, it's not that difficult. I mean, you, you probably know, you, uh, you probably uh, heard about these type of things uh, in the undergraduate, I'm sorry, uh, a freshman physics class. But what we are going to learn from now on is, is uh, uh, probably new to you. So uh, I recommend you to pay more attention. So let me move on to a more complicated problem. And then I'll, I'll spend uh, this lecture and the, probably the first half of the next lecture to solve this problem. The problem is like this. Determine the electric potential distribution inside a rectangular hollow of infinite lengths whose cross section is shown below, okay? So cross section, so you can uh, think of like rectangular uh, pipe and then as you can see, left, right, bottom plate have potential zero. And then top plate have potential V zero. The question is obtain potential everywhere, potential inside the hollow. How to solve? Of course, you can guess the solution, right? You can, what you can guess is something like this. 
Okay, so you have a low potential, low potential at this point. And then you have a high potential uh, here. So in the middle, probably the potential becomes uh, high to low, like, I don't know, something, so, something like this, right? So like this is, let's say this is potential V0 and this is potential uh, three quarter. This is potential one half. This is potential uh, one quarter and this is zero. You can imagine something like this, right? And then another thing uh, that you can guess is that the system has symmetry with respect to uh, X equals B divided by two. So uh, the solution must be symmetric uh, 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 with respect to that axis. So that's what you know. But that's just a kind of vague sense of what, how the solution is gonna look like. What we want to do is we want to get an analytic solution. We want to write a uh, mathematical expression of the solution as a function of X and Y. The question is how to do it. And here we use the technique called series expansion. Okay, so you, you're gonna learn uh, 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 this. By the way, how many of you are familiar with series expansion? Can you raise your hand? Series expansion, like solving the uh, partial differential equation by using series expansion. Any, uh, anyone who's familiar with that concept, please raise your hand. One. Two, three, okay. Three people is familiar, good. Hey, by the way, I, I saw many people turned off their, their camera. Please turn it on, please. Seems like many, many of you, like 14, 13 of you turned off your camera. Please turn it on. It's, it's a basic, like, as I said, it's kind of basic policy that turn having, uh, your camera turned on all the time. Okay, so um, how to solve? Um, so let's do a step-by-step -step approach. So what we are gonna do is we are gonna first, uh, uh, you know, separate the variables into the, the separate the, the function into the, cro, uh, the product of two functions, x and y function, okay? And x function only depends on x, y function only depends on y, okay? So this is just um, what we just uh, assume for now. And then uh, if you apply the Laplace equation to this function, then you know that uh, the x derivatives, only x function is relevant. And then for y derivative, only y function is relevant, right? So you can, you can write equation like this. And then you move uh, one of the uh, term to the other side and you have this, right? Or oh, sorry, uh, you, you, uh, be before doing that, you, you divide uh, both term by x, y, okay? And then, and then move one term to the other side. Then uh, you, you can see an interesting form. You can have an interesting form. This is equal to that. And then each side, uh, you have only x function and you have only y function, right? So, and then x fun as, as I said, x function is only dependent on x y function is only dependent on y, so that they should not uh, 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 have common uh, dependence on the coordinate variable. So this must be same as this, and then this must be same as some constant that is not dependent on uh, uh, coordinate variable, because this function can only depend on x. This function can only depend on y. So if these two are same, then that value must be a constant. Right. 
and, and not depend on the coordinate variable, okay? Kim Jun Mo asks, how do we know VXY is product of X and Y? We don't know. We just assume it for now, okay? We just assume it. Uh, I can, so once we go through uh, the solution like one time, I can give you more detailed explanation how this is possible from first place. But for now, let's just assume it, okay? V can be written as X and Y. Or you can just think of any function uh, that is like uh, the product of X and Y function. Okay, do that. And then you have lambda. Lambda is again constant. So let's first solve for X function, okay? Then, so from this equation, from this equation, you can make X going this way, right? And then you have, you have this equation. Right, second order derivative of x is equal to minus lambda x. And you know the general solution for this, which is trigonometric function, sine and cosine function, or exponential functions. So everyone knows that, right? So everyone knows that the general solution for this is uh, exponential function. Does anyone doesn't know about this? Raise your hand. Everyone knows it, right? This is uh, the, the, the general solution for this is in cosine and sine or, or e to the uh, exponential function, which is the same as a cosine and sine. Okay, so you, you know that. So let's write it as a, uh, a b, gen, uh, b general. So x is a cosine square root lambda x plus b sine square root lambda x. And then a, a and B are undetermined yet, right? And then we apply the two. Oh, okay, Kim Newell asks, can you explain once more why lambda is constant? Okay, so this is a good question. If you look at this equation, uh, this part can only depend on X, right? X is X function. And then this part can only depend on Y. And then if these two are the same, of course, lambda cannot depend on x or y, right? Because if it depends on one of these, then some of these cannot be satisfied. So the only choice is that lambda is not dependent on both. So that lambda is just a constant. Okay, hope that answers your, your question. Okay, so uh, going back to this problem, uh, now you, you have two boundary conditions. When x equals zero, v is zero. And then, and then when, uh, what is it? When x equals b, v is zero, these two boundary conditions. So from that, we know that, uh, x, so x of zero must be zero. So x of zero, if you apply x equals zero, it becomes a, so a is zero. And then uh, x of b is also zero, right? x of b is also zero, which uh, gives you b sine lambda b is zero. So in order to have a non-trivial solution, Non-trivial means uh, the solution other than zero. Uh, the non-trivial solution, uh, B, I'm sorry, uh, lambda N should satisfy this relation, right? N pi divided by B. Then this boundary condition is satisfied, right? The second boundary condition be satisfied by this. And then n must be n must be uh, uh, integer number. 
Okay, and Dongyuan asks, is the gap essential for using uh, Laplace equation? Oh, here. Oh, yes, uh, the gap is essential because, you know, we have a discontinuity. We have V equals zero here, V equals V not here. So if there's no gap, then we have a problem, right? So gap uh, is, is essential. But we, we just assume that this gap is infinitesimally small. So we have only one like uh, uh, like a singular point here. Okay, so um, yes, so that's for x function. And now let's move on to y function. So y function, uh, we have this relation, right? And then the general solution for this is also the exponential function, or you can write it as a cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic, right? This is also a general solution. And then you apply, again, two boundary conditions. One is the bottom boundary condition when y is zero. And the second is the top boundary condition when y equals a. So if you apply the first boundary condition, uh, the, the y equals zero, then uh, you, you immediately notice that C is zero because when, when Y is zero, this term automatically goes away, but this term survives. So C must be zero in order to make the entire term to be zero. So C is determined, right? And then uh, we have one boundary condition left, this boundary condition left. And then if you uh, summarize what we know from uh, so far is that X can have this form, BN, which is a coefficient, sine lambda and X, and then the lambda values are, uh, can only have N pi divided by P. And then N equals one, two, three, four, like all uh, possibilities are possible. Second, for a given uh, uh, N, uh, for, for a given lambda, uh, y function can only have a sine hyperbolic form, right? Because the, the, the bottom boundary condition. So in total, uh, the xy function should have this form, sine square root of lambda n x, sine hyperbolic square root of lambda n y. This is the only uh, this is the only possible solution, right? But the thing is, the thing is, lambda n is what was it like n pi divided by b or some, something like this, right? And then n can be any integer one, two, three, four. So there are infinitely many uh, possibilities because you can take many different lambdas depending on the choice of n, right? So uh, the solution, the actual solution must be a linear combination of these possibilities because each of these satisfies uh, Laplace equation and the boundary condition, right? So each of these, uh, each of, each of these is kind of a possible solution. So linear combination of these is also a valid solution. Satisfies the boundary condition and the Laplace equation, right? And then we have a coefficient. Like when we, when we make a linear combination, we need a coefficient, right? Which is undetermined yet. And the, and the final boundary condition is this. When y equals a, v must be v0 regardless of x. So the question is, can we find vn's that satisfy this relation? Okay. So if we can find vn, that satisfies 
this relation, then that's it. We, we got the solution, right? Although the solution is written as a series form, but it's the solution, that's it, right? So that's how we approach the problem. Next time, what we learn is that how to obtain Vn uh, that satisfies this relation. It doesn't look easy, right? If you look at this, and then if somebody asks you, okay, how to calculate, how to obtain Vn that satisfies this relation, it's not an easy problem, right? It, 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 you have an infinite summation, and then, and then you have one relation, and then you want to find Vn, that satisfies this equation. And, and next time we'll learn how to get the end uh, and solve this series solution. Okay, so um, any question? Okay, so Song Min Chan asks, why do we use hyperbolic function for y? That's also a good question. So, uh, and then I actually wanted to say that, uh, 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 talk about this once we go through uh, the problem once, but because you ask, uh, I'm gonna briefly answer. So here, I internally, uh, just secretly assume that lambda is a positive number, right? Because lambda is positive number, uh, we can say here, uh, this is uh, just a cosine and sine. And then because lambda is positive, uh, this, the solution of this becomes a cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic, right? But this is not justified, right? Because there, there can be other case, right? Depending on the choice of lambda. Like, let's say we just choose, uh, like, uh, say, uh, lambda to be minus, I don't know, my, minus k, okay? Then this equation becomes k, kx. And then the general solution of this now becomes cosine square root kx, a cosine hyperbolic kx, b sine hyperbolic kx. And then uh, uh, and the solution for this becomes a cosine and sine function without hyperbolic. So there are possibilities like that. And then um, uh, what you need to do is actually need to check all the possibilities and then uh, get the right solutions. But here, because I actually know the solution beforehand, I, I omit that process. But if you solve the problem, uh, you have to take into account that possibility too. That's a good question. And uh, what else? Uh, could you explain one more that uh, V0 comes out as a constant? Uh, uh, V0 uh, comes out as a constant. Um, well, that's a, you know, that, that, that is the boundary condition, right? So when, so he, here uh, we have a boundary condition that when Y equals A, V is V0 constant. So that's just the boundary condition. And then from, by applying the, the other boundary conditions like left, right, bottom, we kind of narrow down the form of the solution like this. And then the only boundary condition left is the top boundary condition. So if you uh, plug in y equals a, then this entire uh, formula must be v0, the constant, right? This is just the boundary condition, the top boundary condition. And Song eun -seok asks, when can we assume v x y equals x, uh, x x y y? This is a uh, kind of same question that uh, that uh, you know uh, Kim Jun Mo asks. And um, well, as a matter of fact, um, you can use the separation of variable uh, in all cases. But I'm not. I don't want to talk uh, about. Uh, this in detail right now, but for now, uh, you can just assume that uh, the, the technique of separation of variable can be used uh, like in, in all cases. And I, I'm gonna explain why this is possible uh, next time. But for now, just, just accept it, accept that it's possible. Any other question?
Okay, so next time, I'm gonna briefly uh, recap what we learned today and then tell you how to solve this final boundary condition. Okay, and then that will complete the solution. And then I'll probably go through the problem. This is the same problem again, like uh, filling up uh, the jumps that I made. Okay. And then we'll move on to uh, the image challenge. That's it. Okay, so uh, this is it for today.